Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, friends, and good morning, all participants in our September 11, 2021 webinar. Our COVID Beat, Rack Hospital, COVID Rehab webinars. And our topic today is the effect of smoking on COVID 19 and its management. A few thoughts about smoking. Why would we select a topic like smoking in a COVID rehab webinar? Primarily, the COVID virus has access to the human body through the nose and mouth. It then goes down. Smoke 
thing has a similar entry into the human body through the oral pharyngeal route, the nose and the mouth, and it goes into the lungs, and they combine there to deadly effect. Now, smoking independently is the single largest cause of death worldwide. And I'm talking in terms of a single product that causes death worldwide. Eight million individuals worldwide would die directly from the effect of tobacco and cigarette smoke. Now, if you look at our COVID statistics, you will find, as on date, approximately 4.5 million individuals have succumbed to COVID. And if you look at the total COVID mortality worldwide, which is in the region of 45 to 50 million, the combination of COVID and smoking occupies almost 25% of deaths worldwide at this point of time. Now, in order to discuss this, we have two outstanding speakers. We have sourced them from several countries and we have managed to solicit the help of our pulmonologist from India and our psychologist also from India. Our pulmonologist will talk about the effects of COVID and the causes of COVID. And our psychologist will advise us on how we can manage this most dif difficult dependency, this most difficult addiction. But before that, and before I introduce my first speaker, I would like to acknowledge the support and the presence on our today's webinar. We at RAC Hospital are delighted and profoundly grateful to the UNDRR Arise, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction is what UNDRR stands for. It is a global enterprise and a part of the UN that has been in existence for several decades to manage disasters, either natural or man-made. And in 2020, ARISE, the Alliance for Disaster Resilient Societies emanated out of the UAE, a private sector effort to combine with the UNDRR and governments in order to have a more resilient society, in order to prevent as far as possible all these global disasters. Joining us in today's webinar is our own global, our own group CEO, Dr. Raza Siddiqui. Dr. Raza is also the founding member of the board of UNDRR and ARISE. We are honored with the presence of Dr. Mahmoud Hisham El Borai, the chairman of UNDRR and ARISE, the UAE chapter. Also sitting in our program is Dr. Tariq Nizami, the vice chairman of UNDRR and ARISE. The three names that I mentioned are of course 
of the UNDRR board, but are independently available on the Forbes list of outstanding individuals and also recipients of several awards for global networking, for urban development, and for healthcare. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and an honor to have eminent individuals sitting in on our program today. Our first speaker himself, an outstanding medical professional. When I thought that I would introduce Dr. Sai Praveen Harnath with a few words, I discovered that he had more qualifications in the medical space that I could possibly put on to a single sheet of paper. So I will pick up just a few that I recall. Dr. Sai Praveen Harnath is a specialist in internal medicine, in pulmonology, in critical care, and to my knowledge, also a master of, uh, and also has a master's uh, a certification in public health. Now, that is beyond many other certifications, such as the FACCP, MPH, and so on. Dr. Sai Praveen initially worked at the, permanent, at the Permanente Medical Group, that is Kaiser Permanente in San Francisco. He then moved away from San Francisco to, do, to work amongst the poorer sections of society in India. He has a social outlook to his entire medical endeavors. And he is currently the lead physician Apollo EXS Tele ICU. He is also active in the COVID pandemic for ventilator resource, remote care, and so on. He is an excellent speaker and has spoken at TEDx. Dr. Sai, with specific reference to smoking, is, as I recall, certified and associated with Johns Hopkins in their efforts to combat smoking. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present for the second time on our webinar series, Dr. Sai Praveen Harnath. He had earlier spoken about lung infection in relation to COVID. He will now talk about the sensitive subject of smoking and COVID-19. Dr. Sai. Thank you very much, Dr. Kennedy. Just an audio check that you can all hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine, doctor. Perfect, great, thank you. Dr. Kennedy, it sounded like you're describing somebody else. So thank you so much for uh, that very generous and complimentary uh, introduction. Uh, again, uh, welcome to the audience for joining today from the UAE and other places. I'm in Hyderabad, India. I'm a pulmonary critical care specialist at Apollo Hospitals here. And again, uh, thank you to my co-speaker, Mrs. Savita Date, who will be talking shortly too about the actual work that you need to do to quit tobacco. So I'm going to kind of focus today a little bit on what we can kind of understand about the entire smoking pandemic. And I would, uh, I'm very glad and privileged to also have in the audience the UNDRR team. And uh, honestly, smoking is a disaster. It is a disaster in slow motion. For some people, it is faster than others. And what we do need to intervene in the tobacco disaster and the tobacco pandemic. I'm gonna to try to share my slides and let us hope the gods of technology cooperate. And okay, a quick check. Can you see my first slide? It says tobacco exposure and COVID from bad to worse. Yes, we can so, see it, Dr. Sai. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. So as you can see, you know, we, we all know these facts. None of what I'm going to say is new to you. I'm going to quantify some of the things that I'm going to talk about. But the take-home message, honestly, is if you're a smoker, think about quitting. If you know somebody who's smoking, use this opportunity to say, can I transform their lives? 
Now, the more and more I do all these different talks and webinars, I've realized that audiences need a take home message which you can act on. And my request to you is after today's talk, the one thing I want you to remember and take home is I am going to make the effort to help that smoker that I know, whether it's yourself or somebody else, have a conversation with them, introduce them to smoking cessation resources and take them to the next step. And I think that would be the greatest achievement of the COVID beat series, especially with the RAC Hospital, which has been doing an amazing amount of work in the Arab world and overseas in other countries too. And it's very good that you're actually sticking with it because you've been doing it for several months now. And I'm uh, really thankful to be having this opportunity to talk a second time. Now, if you really look, I have no disclosures that are pertaining to this particular talk. If you look at the, uh, this is my picture of my hospital on the side, and when you look at the millions of people around the world who are impacted by COVID right now, there's honestly not too many things that you can do to help them. One of the things you can do though, is to impact their mental health, as well as impact their addiction to tobacco, because clearly the evidence is overwhelming that tobacco is dangerous, especially in the COVID arena. Unfortunately, COVID is here to stay. You know, we look at the news and say, maybe it was all just a bad dream, but we are in day 620. And I don't know when this is going to end. But as human beings, as professionals, as doctors and nurses and other healthcare personnel, we are used to adversity and we are used to fighting adversity. And I think together we can march forward and try to overcome this challenge that's in front of us. Why are the lungs important? You know, we kind of know that the lungs are important. What is it that they actually do? Now, when you take a breath in, some of this information might be repeating from what my previous talk was, but as a refresher, when you breathe air in, the air goes in, it goes into your trachea, the windpipe, splits into two, goes on each side of the lung, and then it actually distributes out. If you stretch the human lung out, it's the size of a tennis court. When you smoke tobacco, you damage that entire surface area, and the size of the lung keeps decreasing. The lung itself is like a bunch of grapes, and these grapes, when you stretch them out, have a large surface area on which to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. I think we all know that, and this is a very popular quotation. And tobacco does seem to impact people's breathing, along with a lot of other things. Here's a quick refresher for some of you, where we think that the lungs are of different sizes and different people, you're right, but it depends on your height and not your weight. In fact, your best lung size is probably when you're a child. It's probably when you're 12 or 13 years of age. After that, we keep losing lung capacity. And especially if you smoke, you lose a lot more lung capacity. Most of us lose about say 30 ml a year, but if you smoke tobacco, you may lose about 100 ml a year. You may actually lose less if you quit tobacco. You might start losing a little less than 100. With time, that keeps improving. What are the problems with COVID, for example? Right now, we clearly know that there's stress and fatigue. With tobacco, too, you have stress and fatigue, and some people use tobacco as a solution for that, which is not appropriate. You also end up with a low oxygen delivery, lack of endurance. If you have a pre-existing problem of diabetes or coronary disease, you end up in more trouble. And COVID also, of course, causes lung scarring. You can get inflammation, infection, and blood clots. This is a quick schematic. Clearly, this is drawn by me, and I'm not a great artist. But you can see that the alveolus, the grape-like structures that I told you, they get filled with fluid, and with time, they get scarred. So when the lung is already impacted so much from COVID, Adding insult to that and injury to that with tobacco will only make things much worse. There's a CT scan image which shows the black stuff is good lung, the white stuff is bad stuff, where you have mucus in it. And you might have heard that sometimes doctors tell patients to sleep on their stomach, and that's because you can redistribute this injury that is going on in the lung. And when you can see that there is so much of damage going on, it's very important that every little thing that you can do avoiding dust, avoiding pollution, avoiding allergies, trying to avoid a area that is having a lot of dust mites. And of course, avoiding tobacco are all critical, especially if you're healing from a post-COVID or even a post-influenza situation. And this is a, a actual microscopic image of the lung taken from the New England Journal that shows you blood clots which form in COVID. And anytime you get a blood clot, you have low oxygen and the blood does not have a way to get to your lung. When you smoke, you likewise decrease the amount of oxygen that's getting into your body. And that can be a big problem because you already have the impaired lung capacity. Despite everything that we do, it is critical to care, not just as doctors, not just as patients, but as a general public, we really should stop and think, 
okay, if I'm a smoker, what am I doing to my people who are exhaling, inhaling the exhaled smoke? If you know somebody who's smoking, don't feel sensitive and delicate to approach them. Do it in a compassionate way, but it is your responsibility to sit down with them and ask, why do you really smoke? Is it just enjoyment? Is it a habit? In fact, they've done research to show that the tobacco addiction, the brain addiction that happens, the nicotine receptors change, and it's a much more faster hit that they get when they have a whiff of tobacco within seven seconds. In fact, faster than many of the other illicit drugs. We don't know these facts, but early on tobacco companies knew this and they were able to hook people onto tobacco, unfortunately. And it is a biologic addiction, which takes a lot of effort for us to overcome. Anytime you do anything, the medical major mission is first do no harm. Primum non nocere. The same applies to our lives. Do your best to avoid damaging them. And stopping tobacco is one of the primary things that you can do. There are many things you can't control. You can't control secondhand smoke. You're in the you know, environment. There can be allergies. There can be dust. If you're in the UAE, for example, you might have a dust storm coming up. You can't always avoid it. You may have conditions like sleep apnea from obesity. There are some infections we can't avoid. And of course, life, we can't control it. And the COVID pandemic has shown us that. When you have so many things that you can't control, let's catch the things we can control. And one of those is, how do you feel about life? How can you help other people? How can you actually quit tobacco? So my approach to tobacco cessation is a more of a holistic approach where I believe it's not just the pills and the even the psychological support. It's more about understanding how can I impact somebody else's life in a positive way by quitting tobacco? And this is an image I put up and some of you may think this is the planet Neptune with so much water, but honestly it's planet Earth, but looked at it differently. You look at the image of Earth a little differently and you wonder, you know, which planet is this? The reason I often put this slide up is that sometimes you need to approach the problem in a different way. And my approach to tobacco control and tobacco cessation is more as a social approach where I think if people quit tobacco, they're going to help themselves they're going to help society. And the amount of funding they're going to save for themselves, they can use it for something else. And in these hard times where people have economic difficulty, it's very important that people save whatever money they can. What the mind does not know, the eye does not see, and the ear does not hear. And this is applicable. We learn this in medical school where our professors teach us this. We can use this in other areas of our lives too. If you do not know what tobacco does, if you do not know what tobacco cessation can help you with, it's important that you learn that. And this webinar today is aiming to do that. I'm gonna share a few facts now, which kind of go over some of this. And there are some excellent resources. Dr. Kennedy mentioned the Johns Hopkins uh, course that I did on tobacco control. And that course has is a website, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health uh, run by Dr. Bloomberg, actually has a lot of good information on tobacco cessation and control. There's something called the Tobacco Atlas you can look up, and I'm gonna show you a quick slide from there. And you can learn a lot about tobacco pretty quickly. The facts are absolutely sad. The evidence, however, does not mean no action. You have to take action. And you, at the same time, knowing the evidence doesn't mean that people are taking action. And our friends from the United Nations say, will agree that other sister organizations like the WHO have done amazing work at trying to control tobacco use. Tobacco actually kills half its users. And as Dr. Kennedy mentioned, 8 million people are actually dying every year from tobacco. And over 7 million of these are just direct tobacco use. And about 1.2 million are from secondhand exposure. There are about 1.3 billion tobacco users and most of them live in poor countries. Even water pipe use, hookah use is very dangerous. And smokeless tobacco also has, especially people who do chewing tobacco, there are plenty of cancer causing toxins which can cause cancers of pretty much every part of the body, including the head and neck and throat, the food pipe, and even in the mouth. This is a study that done by an expert in tobacco control. And he talked about what are the risks in COVID specifically. And he reviewed all of this information. And it is very clear that people who smoke have a higher chance of dying from COVID. They have a higher chance, even if they're former smokers. If they're a current smoker, there's some conflicting information whether they're actually protected, but there is no clear data that they're actually protected. All of them, especially who smoke, have a higher chance of dying. I want to quickly request people who have turned on their microphone to go on mute again, please, so that the others can hear me clearly. Thank you. So one of the things to remember is that if you should never smoke, then your chance of getting impacted by COVID is absolutely very, very much better than if you were a former smoker. 
Now, the WHO has even talked about COVID and tobacco. If you Google them, you'll come across a website which talks about this. And they have actually suggested that when you smoke, you're going to have hand-to-mouth contact, and that's going to spread the virus if it's on your hands. People are sharing water pipes of hookah, and also many people spit when they chew tobacco. And these are all symptoms of uh, which can actually spread the COVID virus very easily. When you have a, somebody who smokes tobacco, I have the slide up here, which I think we may be sharing later. It has plenty of information about all the different things that slide the graph on the right is taken from the Tobacco Atlas, which kind of points out all the organ systems affected. Now, the evidence is absolutely clear that your immune system is affected, your immunity to protect against infections has decreased, you have more chances of pneumonia increased chance of influenza. And if you do get influenza, you get a worse outcome if you're a smoker. The causal relationships are very clear about causing COPD, which is chronic obstructive lung disease. Now there's something very interesting the body has, which is called a mucociliary escalator. Essentially what it is, it's a little, little hair-like structures in your upper air passages, and they keep pushing the mucus out all day long. When people smoke, they get paralyzed, they don't work and you get mucus build up, which is why many smokers spit up in the morning because overnight they didn't smoke when they're sleeping. These things started working again, they pushed the mucus out. Now, when you have somebody with tobacco use, now the mechanisms where COVID gets impacted is that the receptor is affected. You can get increase in inflammation. You have a rise of the risk of the cytokine storm, which you all heard about. The nicotine receptors are down-regulated, but there's no good data what that means. And if you do have other diseases like COPD, coronary disease, or diabetes, you end up with an increase in tobacco effects. Smoking kills, the data is extremely clear, and it's very important for us to realize that this is in our hands to try and control tobacco use. A picture's worth a thousand holes, I would say, not just a thousand words. This is a Swiss cheese on the left side and right side. You can kind of see the images there. And this is what happens to lungs of people who smoke. You get holes in the lung. And the holes are because the chemicals in tobacco, which are over 5,000 chemicals, in fact, some of them are even radioactive, they completely damage the lung structure. They actually make holes in the lung. And there is no more surface area. That tennis court I told you about might become the size of a table tennis table. And you won't be able to really exchange the gases efficiently. And you end up with COPD, for example. Children are impacted. Now, one of the saddest things about tobacco is Children are the involuntary recipients of tobacco smoke around the world. More ear infections. Their lungs don't grow as much. There is really no safe level of exposure to tobacco. And so many people die prematurely because of tobacco exposure. And over half of children regularly breathe air polluted by tobacco, even in public spaces. And we think about 65,000 people die every year because of illnesses related to second smoke. The condition called sudden infant death syndrome is known to be linked to tobacco. In pregnancy, you get complications of pregnancy and you also get low birth weight. What can we do? We can do individual things, we can do systemic things. There are many smoke-free laws, there are taxes on tobacco, and these are things that the public should encourage because it's important to try to stop it. Tobacco cessation programs work, and as Savita will be sharing shortly, there are methods of quitting. Of course, the best thing is not to start, and we need to get away from thinking that, oh, it's okay, it's one more cigarette. Oh, it's okay, they're just having it socially. Because honestly, there is extremely good data for several decades saying that there is no safe level of tobacco use. There is really no safe level of tobacco smoking. There is no safe level of tobacco chewing. The facts are clear. The evidence is right in front of us. In fact, the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control has given us a set of steps which tell us how do we do this? Monitor tobacco use, protect people from tobacco abuse, offer them help to quit tobacco use. And I'm very glad that Professor Kennedy's team at REK is actually doing that today. We need to warn about the dangers of tobacco, enforce those bans on tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorship, and raise the taxes on tobacco. The UAE, for example, has a very large expatriate population from around the world, including India. Perhaps the people in the UAE through your hospital can become ambassadors for their family back home. Because honestly, the knowledge needs to be percolated and really shared with people around the world. Individuals can quit. And as Savita might share and as Professor shared earlier, within 20 minutes of quitting, your heart rate improves, your blood pressure improves. Within 12 hours, the carbon monoxide level drops. 
Within about three months or so, your circulation improves. And within about nine months or so, even your coughing and shortness of breath decrease. And I've not put the other facts, but your risks of lung cancer, your risks of coronary disease, your risk of cholesterol level, all of these things get better. I think you need to exercise your right to breathe. And this is a quick poem we just composed. Each step's a marathon. Every breath critical to carry on. Is quitting tobacco possible is the question at hand. And when the evidence says so, let's stop saying no. And I'm glad that Professor Kennedy has taken this opportunity to enforce this quotation, which I like, which says that never stop learning because life never stops teaching. And I would like to thank you again for your attention. And your take home message today is, let me go find that tobacco user around me today. Let me sit down with them and understand why do you smoke? Simple exercise to take a sheet of paper, draw a line in the middle and say, why I smoke? Why do I want to quit? The facts are in fact very clear that most smokers want to quit. They need a little nudge, a little push, information from the healthcare provider. And I'm so happy that I am able to share the information today. And every one person who stops tobacco is helping not just their own lives, but cutting down that number of people who die from secondhand tobacco abuse. So I'm going to stop there and thank you again for this wonderful option, Professor Kennedy and your team. Dr. Vicky, thank you very much. And Savita, look forward to your presentation on how to actually do it. Thank you again. And thank you, Dr. Sai. Thank you so much. I am constantly amazed at how much I learn during all these webinars. And while Dr. Sai has been kind enough to mention me by name, I have to emphasize that this effort of conducting these webinars would never have been possible if it were not for Rack Hospital. And of course, our absolutely dynamic CEO, Dr. Raza Siddiqui, who is also a founding member of the board of UNDRR Arise. And I thank him for all the efforts that all the support that he gives us to make this possible. Now about the learnings, I, as I mentioned, I'm constantly amazed at how much I learn from these webinars. I've just made a few points hurriedly so that I remember. And Dr. Sai has mentioned that smokeless tobacco is as dangerous as tobacco is. And the hookah or the shisha, as uh, we use in this part of the world, is equally damaging to our lungs. He also mentioned that smokers, and he is a pulmonologist of great repute. He also mentioned that smokers have a more problematic medical outcome after they get COVID. And earlier when I was reading about smoking and COVID, we discovered that approximately 40% of individuals who are hospitalized as a consequence of COVID are in fact smokers. The hole in the lung caused by the 5,000 chemicals and toxins in cigarette smoke is an eye opener. And the effect of smoking on children, their addiction to smoking as a consequence of adult smoking, the effect of smoking on the fetus of the unborn child. All of this we have learned from Dr. Sai. But there was one sentence or in Dr. Sai's presentation that caught my attention, which helps us to quantify the importance of our next session. And that sentence is that without support, only 4% of individuals are able to give up smoking. And now we come to the second speaker of today's session, Dr. Savita Date. Now, 
Dr. Savita Date uh, uh, is, is a psychologist, I, I, I give you that. And uh, she specializes amongst other things in stress management. And today, Dr. Savita will have to use, use all her experience to manage her own stressors. Ladies and gentlemen, would you believe me? Just seconds before the session started, we were informed by Dr. Savita that her system is not working. Neither is the camera working or whatever the problem was and that she would solve the problem. And I hope that Dr. Savita has in all calmness managed her stress and solved the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce Dr. Savita, who is a clinical psychologist trained out of Mumbai, and she has a PhD. But more than her PhD, more valuable than her PhD, is her several decades of practice. She has worked, besides working in Mumbai in the KEM hospital, she has worked with the department and set up the Department of Psychiatry in Tata Steel, the Tata Main Hospital. She then went on in her pioneering effort and set up the, set up the entire wellness program and the psychological profile in Apollo Life. She went on to become a professor and a teacher with the Harvard Medical School where uh, they visited India, and she was a member of their various seminars, and then went off to Harvard and did a few programs over there. And similarly, she has lectured at the TMDC, XLRI, IIM, the CII, and several other factors, and several other institutions. As a matter of fact, if we talk about institutions, I asked her to give me a small list of institutions that she had uh, conducted her programs in. And unfortunately, the list was extremely long. It had almost a hundred uh, corporates, but I will name a few HSBC worldwide, whether it was Singapore or whether it was uh, India or whether it was Sri Lanka, she has lectured through the HSBC organization. JP Morgan, Deloitte, Novartis, Standard Chartered, and several, several organizations in the UAE. She has authored two books on health psychology. She is a faculty uh, in the Preventive and Promotive Healthcare Program. She is an author and has written for several newspaper editorials, including the Times of India and, of course, our own College Times, you see her articles come up frequently. Uh, I must mention that uh, Dr. Savita has, uh, I, I, uh, in jo jo as a joke I say, she is a movie star. She has actually filmed more than 26 plus 13, that would make it 39 episodes of psychology in NDTV, which is India's leading TV channel, and she is a referral expert on wellness and mental health. She also counsels in, she counsels prisoners in the various jails uh, around our country. But coming to our program today, she is the lead faculty in smoking cessation for Champex, the Chapex Pharma uh, group that manages uh, several uh, NRT products, United Health Insurance in the United States and Amex Corporation. Dr. Savita, I do hope that uh, any of your systems are working and that you will be able to join us today on this webinar. Dr. Savita. Thank you so much, Professor Kennedy. Thank you for inviting me for this session, as well as an earlier one, perhaps your first or your second. 
Uh, and thank you also for making me <laughs> much more famous than I actually am. Uh, I must also thank Dr. Raza Siddiqui. He's solely responsible for me having done a lot of work in UAE. So UAE as well as India, both are extremely dear to my heart. Uh, I must congratulate the directors of UNDRR Arise. There is so much of work and concerted and committed work that you are doing for the citizens of UAE. Uh, I wish more countries could take a cue from you. Uh, so thank you so much and congratulations for the work that you are doing. Uh, I could move on to my slides and uh, I think Sade and Dr. Wilko are helping me with the slides because I was, as mentioned earlier, I was having a lot of issues. I have two laptops. Both of them decided to dial out on me and I have some good friends who have stepped in to help me. Now this picture that you see over here, friends, this picture is a picture of reality when I first started conducting workshops on smoking cessation. And that was perhaps 10, 11, 12 years ago, one of the first corporates to start doing a lot of work for its employees in this area was in fact Amex. And uh, Amex invited me to conduct a series of workshops for uh, uh, their employees who were choosing to quit smoking. And as I walked into the corporate, uh, the people who I met outside were the same people who were actually attending my session inside. And the reason is all corporate campuses are off smoking. All corporate campuses do not permit smoking on campus. So most of the people were stepping outside on the street to smoke. Uh, this is before smoking rooms had come in and so on and so forth. And the picture that you see over here was the site of a street, a similar picture of, of a site of a street where there were a lot of smokers who had stepped out of their corporate for a break. Next, please. In a very, very simple way, let us understand this first. In a very, very simple way, whether it is drugs or tobacco or alcohol, either of them is a substance that in fact your body has no need of. There is no known need that tobacco has to your body, but you cannot do without it. Now, if I give you an example of, say, a neem leaf, a neem leaf is also called as uh, Indian lilac, or the scientific name is uh, azadiracta. And yes, I needed to refer to a paper to get that word right. Um, it is supposed to be very useful for the human body because it boosts your human system. It boosts your immunity. It boosts your, all the systems in your body. And therefore, during COVID, a lot of people have become conscious and actually started taking a few neem leaves every day. Now, I must tell you, a neem leaf is perhaps one of the most bitter things that you can actually consume. But why would you do that? Because the body can do with it, because the body can be benefited from it. Um, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. So you will try to have an apple a day. Um, a banana a day will give you a lot of instant energy, so you will try and have a banana a day. But tobacco is something, is a substance that your body does not need, but you cannot do without. And I underline, but you cannot do without. Next, please. And adding to that is an addiction, which means it is loss of control over drug taking behavior. Now, on the one hand, you have a substance that your body does not need, but you cannot do without it, which means that you have moved into an addiction and an addiction gives you no control over drug taking behavior. Now you think that you control the cigarette. You can have as many cigarettes as you want. Today you decide to have 10. Uh, tomorrow you may decide to have only four or five. This is an assumption that you make telling yourself that I am in control of my addiction. I am in control of tobacco and how much tobacco I choose to continue. However, there is loss of control over drug taking behavior, which means if you move out of denial and come into reality, the reality is that it is not you that controls the number of cigarettes you have. It is the cigarettes that control you. It is the tobacco that controls you, not you controlling tobacco. So addiction combined with the substance itself is a loss of control over drug taking behavior. And the last part of this is even with compelling reasons. Now, there are people who have uh, serious situations, serious health factors, serious health issues, and they get admitted to a hospital, perhaps go into a cath lab or what have you. One of uh, 50% of people who recover from a myocardial infection or a heart attack, 50% of people who are smokers 
a month after they have had they have recovered from a heart attack a month after that 50 percent of smokers will go back to smoking that is the compelling reason that even then smokers are not able to stay away from cigarettes next please just to tell you that this is something that is uh, confirmed by dsm as well as by icd what is an addiction severe substance use disorder uh, a brain disease of compulsive substance use despite harmful consequences. Next, please. We need to understand that there are some chemical substances that are at play over here, neurochemical substances that are, that are at play that make you continue your substance abuse despite compelling reasons. And the most famous or rather infamous substance uh, here is called dopamine. Now we have two systems uh, in our thinking patterns. One is the cerebral cortex in our brain that helps us to think and that helps us to think logically, rationally, analytically, and so on. And the other system that helps us to emote that is responsible for our emotional uh, well-being, let's say, is uh, the limbic system. And the limbic system by and large is around the prefrontal pre cortex, which is what is majorly responsible for dopamine. And dopamine is something that gets us hooked onto a substance and then holds us in that area of substance. I will talk about the pleasure cycle that dopamine creates uh, a few slides later. Now, on the left side of the slide, you can see various substances that we know people can get addicted to. Tobacco comes at the bottom, but there are various substances that people can get addicted to that are all substances and addiction. But on the right hand side, you will see that there are many addictions, but they have nothing to do with any substance at all. People can be addicted to gambling, people can be addicted to adventure activity, thrill seeking activity and so on. And that is because dopamine is secreted, whether it is a substance or whether it is these, these addictions, which are not substances, but the same dopamine gets you addicted and thereafter keeps you addicted. That is the point that we need to understand that the brain is just as much involved as any other system in the body when it comes to substance and abuse. Next, please. So quickly for you to ask yourself, are you addicted? Two simple statements in the first point itself. One, do you have a strong urge which you cannot beat, a strong urge? And two, do you are you trying to cut down or quit, but you are unable to cut down or quit? The first part is impaired control, which means that you cannot control the strong urge and you cannot control the cutting down or quitting. So impaired control is something that is a very strong part of substance abuse. And if you feel that this is something you have, yes, it has taken you far into uh, your process of addiction. If your work life is being impacted in many ways, if you will allow your work life to get impacted in many ways because you do not want to give up on the time that you need for your addiction, then that is another serious area, a serious indication for you that yes, you have moved way into the journey of addiction. Let's say you are driving your car with one hand, perhaps holding your phone with another uh, or wanting to light your cigarette with the other, thereby moving your attention away from the road. This is a, a, a risky situation that you're creating for yourself, but you cannot stop from lighting the cigarette as you are driving your car. You are putting yourself in harm's way. Risky use is a third factor that is very significant in addiction. And the tolerance, which means as you go along in your journey of addiction, you will need more and more of the same substance to give you that feeling of satisfaction and, and comfort that you were originally getting. So a need for larger amounts is the fourth factor that is very significant for you to decide that, yes, I am way into this journey of addiction. Next, please. Many, many famous people who have been smokers, have been regular smokers, chain smokers, and so on. And one of the major reasons for this is smoking had a huge social acceptance. To some extent, alcohol, uh, you know, surprisingly and shockingly to a large extent with the younger population, drugs are beginning to get a social acceptance. And you will rarely find a party with a, with a younger age group where drugs are not put out on the table. That's, that's the um, state that we are moving towards. However, because of social acceptance, this is, uh, some of these people are definitely the previous generation, some of them are our generation. 
You will find over here politicians, authors, writers, scientists. Uh, and then let's not forget that there are cartoon characters and fic fictional characters as well. For instance, you cannot think of Sherlock Holmes without a pipe in his hand. You cannot think of Popeye, for instance, without a can of um, spinach, and on the other hand, uh, a pipe as well. So smoking has been part of many, many, many famous people, whether they be comic characters or whether they be politicians like say, uh, Barack Obama, or John F. Kennedy, or even let's say for instance, Nehru coming from India, the first prime minister, next please. One of the most famous, famous people is Winston Churchill. And that's because of his attitude towards smoking and drinking. And his attitude was uh, his statement that says, my rule of life prescribed as an absolute sacred right, smoking cigars and also the drinking of alcohol before, after, and if needs be, during all meals and the intervals between them. Yes, he was considered to be a person who smoked, uh, who spoke very strong words, but I would say that this is perhaps uh, you know, uh, something that, that needs to be underlined, uh, underlined as his attitude. And this was what he believed in. He was never perhaps caught without a glass of scotch in one hand and his cigar in the other hand. I must say, ladies and gentlemen, he lived to 91 plus years. And the reason I have put his slide up over here is because this is an example that most smokers like to use when they are in denial. They say if Winston Churchill could live to 91 years, why do I have to quit at a young age? Not everyone is Winston Churchill. Not everyone is the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain when it is fighting World War II. Uh, next, please. So Dr. Sai Praveen, our pulmonologist, spoke about cigarettes and the holes that they make in the lungs. The journey begins with your mouth moves towards your lungs and friends thereafter it moves forward to make holes in your brain. And the reason for the addiction is because of the impact that cigarette smoking has on the brain. If the, if the damage were up to the lungs, it could be one major area that needs to be treated. But the reason that it moves way further and then goes beyond control is because of the impact that it, that it creates in your brain. And therefore, let's quickly take a look at how this happens. So, all that a smoker thinks about is how do I light up my next cigarette? And therefore, uh, the thinking stops when a smoker finds a cigarette, lights it up and takes the first drag. The thinking stops because that's all that is relevant for the smoker. However, what happens, the science behind it is that the smoker takes a drag. The moment the smoker takes a drag, nicotine is distilled from tobacco and this nicotine then travels towards your lungs. This distilled nicotine with smoke particles travels towards your lungs and it is then very rapidly and quickly absorbed in the pulmonary venous circulation. From here, it enters the arterial circulation and from here, it moves to the brain. Now, having created holes in the lungs, now it moves to the brains. Here, it, it diffuses with the brain tissue. It binds with the nicotine receptors and then channels and gateways open up, allowing for many neurotransmitters to be released. Now this has entered into your brain. Now seven well-known neurotransmitters are being released. Next, please. And these are the neurotransmitters that are released with that cigarette that has been smoked. So the smoker has taken one puff from the cigarette and already this is what is happening in the brain. Dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, glutamate, serotonin, beta endorphin, GABA, these are the seven neurochemicals that get released in the brain. And look at the impact of these seven neurotransmitters. Three of them suppress appetite. Three of them will regulate mood. Two of them give you cognitive and memory enhancement. Two are responsible for a state of arousal. And one gives you pleasure. And of all of these, that one is dopamine that moves towards giving you pleasure. That one that is dopamine gives you pleasure and puts you in a pleasure cycle where you are going round and round in that vicious cycle. Friends, when you think about a smoker and why the smoker has difficulty quitting smoking, look at these seven neurotransmitters at work over here. Look at the benefit and the reward that the smoker is getting 
And once you get into this cycle, it's almost like a trap. Definitely, we need to empathize and understand that it is not easy for the smoker to quit because there is so much of reward that the brain is giving to that smoker. I am not saying that it needs to be encouraged, but I'm saying it needs to be understood. Because if you don't understand something, you cannot treat it, you cannot help the person to get away from it. So these are all um, you know, the neurochemicals at work and all the rewards in a manner of speaking that the uh, smoker is getting. Next, please. Professor Kennedy, I'm likely to just go on and on speaking. So maybe uh, two, three minutes before I really should uh, go to a hard stop, you can just give me a signal that my time is getting up. I don't mind being reminded. Uh, okay, ma'am. Dr. Sai Praveen has spoken about this slide already, so I'm not going to go into the details of the physiology, but you need to understand that there is physiology, and then a lot of the symptoms that have been put inside, for instance, bad breath, uh, you know, smelly hair, yellow teeth, stained fingers, a whole lot of these also are things that you need to look at. You may go to the gym, you will never be able to work out to capacity. You will also have that cigarette that is responsible for a poorer muscle tone, so there is a lot at play over here that you need to look at. <clears throat> Next, please. 90% of the world smokes cigarettes or smoking tobacco. The rest of the world goes into other tobacco products. And as a result, 90% of the world will go into lung-related ailments when it comes to tobacco. 10% of the world will go into perhaps uh, oral ailments when it comes to tobacco. So that is because it is chewing tobacco in different forms that 10% of the world goes, goes into and 90% of the world uh, smokes a cigarette and therefore will go into oral, lung and those kind of uh, issues. Now, why did 90% of the world move to smoking rather than chewing tobacco? Remember, originally the world was into chewing tobacco. There were very few uh, civilizations. The, the Maya and the Aztec civilization actually uh, perhaps may have started off with uh, uh, smoking tobacco. Thereafter, somewhere around World War II, cigarettes became far, far more uh, popular. Till then, it was more pipes and uh, perhaps cigars, but definitely pipes that were more popular. One of the reasons why 90% of the world smokes cigarettes is because smoking or inhalation is the fastest route to the brain. And if you want to get that kick from the cigarette that you are smoking, then what better way than to take a drag from your cigarette for that to go to your lungs and before you know it, for it to travel to the brain because inhaling is the best route to the brain. That's one of the biggest reasons why 90% of the world population smokes a cigarette rather than uh, continues using a uh, chewing tobacco, which was done uh, by our ancestors. Next, please. So this figure is now going to be corrected to 4,000 trace chemicals uh, since the study that was put up by uh, Dr. Raza Siddiqui and uh, Dr. Adrian Kennedy, 4,000 trace chemicals. If, if we don't stop somewhere, I don't know how many chemicals we're going to discover uh, that one so-called innocent looking cigarette uh, might have. Friends, the danger over here is out of these 4,000 trace chemicals, 3,999 are dangerous, they are toxic, they are carcinogenic, uh, they are poisonous. One out of these, only one out of these is addictive, and that is nicotine. Can you imagine the 3999 are harming your body, and your mind will tell you that this is harming my body, and I should get rid of it. But why are you not able to get rid of it? Because of this one substance that is nicotine, out of the 3999, on the one hand, and this one on the other hand, they cannot conquer or beat this one. Because this one is responsible for keeping you hooked on to the tobacco and the other 3999 are then responsible for causing you all the huge damage. Uh, some of those are mentioned over here, but every one of us is well informed. And more than anybody else, every smoker is well informed of the damage that, uh, that tobacco is doing to his or her system. So I don't need to discuss the 3999. But what I do need to tell you is that while your rational mind is completely aware that 3999 are toxic, the emotional mind, the limbic system, and the nicotine and the dopamine from that system is responsible for that one nicotine substance continuing to cause the damage to you. 
Next, please. If you need any real reason, as in a cosmetic reason, because sometimes uh, cosmetology is much more powerful than physiology, then understand that 75% of our skin is collagen. And one of the factors that disturbs this collagen, that reduces this collagen, and as a result, that removes or reduces the smoothness of your skin, the elasticity of your skin, and the durability of your skin is smoking. And there is another factor that does this, and that is aging. And that's a natural progression. As you get much older, you will find that your skin is losing its elasticity. For instance, if you hold your hand up and pinch your skin, you will find that in the moment you leave your skin, it goes back to where it was. You know, that's because your skin is very elastic, very durable. And I must say, I don't have the same elasticity now as I did maybe 10 years ago. However, a smoker will increase the aging and as a result even if a smoker is not so old the elasticity elasticity durability of your skin will reduce a great deal because the collagen is reducing a great deal within you so if for no other reason then for reasons of vanity for reasons of having a good skin uh, a good appearance one strong factor to look at fitting next please Uh, one thing that I wanted to tell you, friends, countries have tried to help people quit smoking. Uh, corporates have tried to help people to quit smoking. And why do countries and corporates do that? Because the most productive age group is the smoking age group. The smoking age group is the most productive and therefore they cost not only themselves and their family a great deal, they cost the corporate a great deal. They also cost the country a great deal. And there are many countries that are doing a lot of work one of the countries that has in fact done significant amount of work and their work has been consistent in this area is Australia. In 1991, before Australia started or launched its campaign of quit smoking, which they launched in 1997 or, or thereabouts, in 1991, 25% of the population of Australia smoked. In 2016, that, that figure came down to 12.8%. And in 2019, the figure came down to 11.6%. I'm sure between 2019 and now, the figure would have come down a, a lot. One of the biggest factors would be COVID. Now, what is it that sustains you, keeps you hooked on to smoking uh, beyond that pleasure cycle? Let's understand this. While I have put down over here many cues and triggers, let's imagine that you are a smoker and I am talking to you that is a smoker. You want to concentrate on a project and you want to work really seriously, really hard. You want to build your focus. What is that one factor that you look towards to build your focus? You're right. You think if I have a cigarette, I will be able to focus better. Now imagine that you have finished your project and you want to relax You feel that my stress is over. I need to take a deep breath and I need to just chill a little bit. Now, what is the one thought that comes to your mind when it comes to relaxing and chilling a little bit? Again, you're right, it's a cigarette. You think that if I have a cigarette, I will be able to chill much better. You're bored. What do you use to kill your boredom? You light up a cigarette. You want to take a break from work and you get yourself a cup of tea and step out. Now, when your left hand holds a cup of tea, what is your right hand dying to do? Think, yes, your right hand is dying to light up a cigarette because this is the power of association or conditioning. Your mind is conditioned to put these two things together. Whatever the emotion may be, that emotion is accompanied by a cigarette because you see a cigarette or tobacco as helping you to deal with whatever the emotion may be, whether it is stress or boredom or focus or concentration, whatever that might be. Also with every habit, whether it is tea or coffee or alcohol, um, again, or whatever the habit may be. It could be that after a meal, I like to have a black coffee, but for a smoker, it could be after a meal, I like to have a cigarette. So tobacco becomes associated with habits, with emotions, and these become cues and triggers that trigger you into picking up a cigarette and then that sustain the habit of smoking thereafter. Next, please. Let's talk about the journey of smoking. How did it start and how does it hold you in that state? 
The underlying factor over here, friends, is assumption of self-mastery. When in the journey of quitting smoking, this is one of the biggest factors that everyone needs to keep in mind, assumption of self-mastery. But let me start with the origin. The origin is initiation, and that initi initiation happens because of social reasons. So imagine that you are in high school or in junior college, maybe. Imagine that that's about the age group that you are in. And when you look around you, you find that many of your peers, in fact, are smoking. Some of them are smoking a lot. Some of them are smoking a little. And somehow or the other, there is this cool image of a, a person who is smoking. A person who is smoking uh, is cool. People like to hang out with that poor person. And so therefore, there is an acceptance that is created. And this acceptance, you're observing all of this. You haven't yet gotten into the journey. You're observing all of this. And this observation is preparing you to move along this journey of smoking. The next step being initiation where people push you, you're choosing to hang around with these people. They push you to just have a smoke, to just have one puff only. Just try it one time. If you don't like it, you can always quit and give it up. So therefore you decide to experiment with it. You're hanging around with your peer group. There is always availability of tobacco. So these factors initiate you into your journey of tobacco and smoking. And from initiation, those smokers who smoke up to four cigarettes a day in the first year of their initiation. If you have moved into four cigarettes a day in the period of your initiation, then chances are that you are moving towards becoming a habitual smoker. You will very likely be a habitual smoker. That's what statistics indicates two to three years of continuing smoking, gradually increasing the number of cigarettes you have will put you in a state of habitual smoking. And what holds you in that state of habitual smoking is what we spoke in the previous slide, that is cues and triggers, whether they are behavioral, habit-related, psychological, or emotional, all these cues and triggers will then make it very difficult to move out of this habitual state. At some point, every smoker comes to a, a, a decision to, to quit smoking, to stop sm smoking. You will be surprised, 70% of smokers decide every year that they need to quit. Out of the 70%, 30 to 40% actually try. Every year, 30 to 40% of smokers actually try to quit smoking. However, about one to 3% succeed in quitting, friends about one to 3% succeed in quitting. This 97 odd percent that tries and does not succeed in quitting would be greatly impacted if professional services were available in the form of workshops within corporates, in the form of uh, countries deciding that they need to make available a lot of facilities for smokers to quit. If there were professional support services available, then this one to 3% that uh, quits and successfully quits, there is no reason why this one to 3% would not be much higher. So people smit for, uh, quit for two reasons. One is health concerns and two is family pressure. You would imagine that family pressure is a little bit nagging and so therefore people would quit for health concerns. Yes, people do quit for health concerns, but like I mentioned to you, out of the smokers who get into the hospital and survive a heart attack, uh, and friends, you need to know this. One of the factors that will, that will reduce the survival of a heart attack in terms of you reaching the hospital to get the help in the first place is a secret. So smokers reduce their chances of reaching the hospital to survive at least to the point where they can get medical care. They reduce their chances by 50%. So now I'm talking about those people who survive to reach the hospital, who survive their heart attack, of these smokers, 50% of these smokers, after a month of being in a hospital, getting treated, going home, rehabilitating, will go back again to smoking. So health concerns are important, but there is also the other side where the 50% is concerned. On the other hand, is family pressure. For many of you who have quit or know people who have quit and stayed quit, very often, family pressure is the one reason that you quit and then do not go back to smoking. Let's say uh, you give a promise to a family member. You are afraid if you break the promise that some harm may fall on the family member. 
let's say a grandfather commits to a grandchild that I am going to quit uh, because you don't like my breath and you refuse to give me a kiss on my cheek. That grandfather is definitely never going to go back to smoking. So family pressure and the emotionality that is tied up with that family pressure is one of the most significant factors, friends, in the journey of stopping and then not resuming to go back into uh, uh, to tobacco. And then the third factor that we are talking about is the bigger reality, and that is resuming. 97% of people will resume and go back again into smoking. And that is because they cannot withstand withdrawal. And the two factors I said right in the beginning, and that is one is a craving and two is difficulty or inability to quit. So craving to continue on the one hand and difficulty inability to quit on the other hand. And then you have the cues and triggers that are a constant reminder to you. If I pick up a cup of tea, my reminder because of association and because of conditioning, my reminder is my other hand was always holding a cigarette. So this association becomes um, a major factor in pushing you back into resuming tobacco. Friends, there is an assumption of self-mastery. Right in the beginning, I spoke about loss of control over drug taking behavior or loss of control over tobacco, for instance. Most smokers are in a state of denial. So the denial is that if I have quit and it's been a significant time that I have quit, then let's say I'm having a good time. We are having all my alumni out here. We are meeting after years of having left school and college and we're all having a great time. And then there is this group that is smoking. I happen to gravitate to this group that is smoking and they all naturally persuade me and say, come on, don't be so silly. Just take one drag. It's not going to do you any damage. By the time you get home, you can go back to being quit and staying quit. The person is making an assumption over here of self-mastery. And the group, the smoking group also does not understand that there is an assumption that they are making of self-mastery. The smoking journey starts with experimenting with smoking. From there, as you can see, it moves towards social or casual smoking. Before you know it, some of you become habitual smokers. Some of you try to cut down, some of you quit smoking. The last part over there is if you become a quit smoker, does it mean that you can go back to the beginning of the journey, which is can you then move towards becoming a social or a casual smoker? Friends, that ship has sailed. When you moved from social and casual smoking and you move down towards habitual or addicted smoking, this, the ship from casual sailed and you can never come back to that safe state again. So if you have one puff of your cigarette, you will go back again to habitual smoking, to being addicted to smoking. There is no control that you have and therefore you can never come back to a state of social or casual smoking. That ship has sailed, it is gone. You can either stay quit or you can then go back again to smoking the same or perhaps a little more than what you were smoking when you quit. Next, please. Uh, uh, Doc Savita, you wanted me to remind you when there was five minutes. Thank you so much. I'm going to just try and rush through uh, my slides. I saw a couple of comments right in the beginning in the chat group that said if you can go slow. So I thought that I would go slow, but I think I really need to pick that up. Next, please. Okay. This is the chain of pleasure that I have been talking about. Um, if somebody can tell me what is the slide number, I know how many I have left. 20 number. 20. The slide number is 20 and you have another two slides okay, after this. Okay, great, great, great. So uh, this is the chain of pleasure that we are talking about. When there is dopamine, dopamine activates pleasure, but this pleasure, it recedes very quickly. It, just, it recedes very quickly, then triggering withdrawal. Now that the pleasure has gone, now you want that pleasure back. So therefore there is withdrawal. And from withdrawal is craving. Now there is that taste of the last cigarette that you had. And now you want your next break so that you can step out of your office and get back again to smoking. And you really are waiting and waiting for the next break. So the trap here is dopamine activating pleasure, pleasure receding quickly, taking you towards a state of withdrawal. Withdrawal then resulting is in craving, and then the craving resulting in you going back again to a cigarette, 
which will again trigger off dopamine and pleasure. This becomes a cycle, a chain of pleasure. And this is the chain of pleasure that holds you into, into smoking and then makes it extremely difficult for you to quit smoking. Next, please. Friends, there are many therapies available. Like I said, you could quit for health reasons. You could quit for uh, family pressure. You could take professional help and you could use many of these methods uh, to cut down and to quit. One of the best things that I have found in cutting down and quitting is counseling and group support. So if you work with a psychologist facilitating your group sessions, if you tie up with a buddy and the two of you work together, then the last two points over here are very, very successful in your journey of to some people cutting down to some people quitting cold, but either which way sustaining the quitting of, of uh, tobacco. One thing that everybody needs to understand, some people think that they can be on the cutting down journey uh, for all of their lives. All roads must ultimately lead to quitting. As an anonymous saying says, sooner or later, everyone quits. And you know why, either you make yourself quit or circumstances will make you quit. So sooner or later, everyone quits. And as Mark Twain said, uh, on the slightly humorous side, it's easy to quit smoking. I have done it a hundred times. Friends, most often successful quitting takes about four attempts. Before you come to any success in your quitting journey, it might take you up to four attempts before you get successful, before you actually quit and before you're able to actually sustain uh, this quit journey. So you could try many methods that have been put down over here, but I urge you to move towards group support, counseling, uh, your psychologist facilitating you, you tying up with the buddy where both of you work towards cutting down and quitting and then staying quit. This will increase the one to 3% success rate that you have of quitting and staying quit. Next, please. Next, please. Many people talk about NRT. Is NRT safe? Uh, one answer to them is NRT is much safer than tobacco. So uh, there are many substances that have been put down over here, whether they are patches, whether it's gum, whether it's uh, inhalers, nasal sprays, whichever you have, and some medication as well that is available. You can choose any of these, but choose the medication along with your pulmonologist because the pulmonologist knows best what is going to work for you. But the end of every journey, friends, whether it is NRT or medication is quitting and staying quit. Sometimes, unfortunately, people can get addicted to NRT products as well. Uh, there's a very famous writer, JK Rowling, you, you all will have heard of her courtesy. Um, what is that series that, uh, what is that series that she wrote? wrote? Uh, and many movies were made on that. Anyway, it's, it's giving my mind, I'm sure it'll come back to me. Harry Potter. Harry Potter is right. Thank you, Prof. So, um, J.K. Rowling quit smoking, went on to NRT, and then she was not able to give up the NRT that she was she was she had moved into because she had become addicted to NRT. I have a couple of uh, people that I work with who also have not been able to go beyond that state. Uh, perhaps it's a lesser evil that the person is ad uh, addicted to, but there is a chance of this happening as well. Friends, I think that is the last of my slides. Uh, next, please. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'm sure we have a little bit of time left for queries. Prof, thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Dr. Savita. I uh, have never had the good pleasure of listening to you talking for such a long duration uh, uh, in the recent past. And such great information. Thank you so much. Uh, it is worrying to know that we don't control tobacco, that tobacco controls us. And the entire range of neurotransmitters that you spoke about only exemplified the abundance of knowledge that you presented in this area. Thank you ever so much for that. Uh, uh, a few days back, I was in Hyderabad and I met a friend at one of our uh, rare social functions, and uh, he had quit smoking. And uh, I, I was surprised 
And I said, and why did you quit smoking? And he said, because I smelt so bad. And you are absolutely right. Bad breath, bad smell uh, uh, is one of the vanity processes in quitting smoking. But I appreciate uh, the NRT and medication aspects. Uh, when I was very much younger and we were working in terms of quit smoking methodology, all we had is the different cut down methods. And now uh, your uh, abundant information has added NRT and medication, which makes life so much easier for those of us who smoke. Thank you very much, Dr. Savita. And now I hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Wilku, who has received uh, a range of questions. Uh, Dr. Wilku, if you can select the best ones uh, uh, for our faculty, I will be so grateful. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilku. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. First of all, thank you to Dr. Uh, Sai and Dr. Savita both uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, Dr. Sai uh, has clearly, am I audible? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Sai yes, has Dr. given- Yes, Okay, thank you, sir. Dr. Sai has given all the inputs, what exactly happens in the lungs and other uh, organs. And many of the queries which we received, uh, he also covered uh, during his session and wonderfully uh, presented Dr. Savita uh, because quit smoking program is a very lengthy program, not less than two or three hours uh, for a session. And she has compiled in a very short manner, but uh, very good. Many of the question, queries which we received, uh, she also, also covered, but I will be taking few questions uh, first. Yeah. One minute, please. Yeah, Mr. Hatsahed Singh is asking, uh, I have a family history of cancer. I'm exposed to secondhand smoking. Am I at risk? Dr. Sai, this will be, uh, I think this will, you'll be the best person to answer this. Sure, uh, thank you, Dr. Vilku. And uh, Savita, that was an amazing presentation. I learned a tremendous amount of practical tips I can actually use. and. I'm referring people to psychologists like yourself. I think it's very good to understand the whole spectrum that you cover with tobacco mm -hmm. cessation. So uh, with yes. this question, I will go, uh, I actually answered some of these on the chat, not sure how much time we would have, but honestly, uh, secondhand smoke is a very dangerous thing by itself. And if you already have a family history of uh, cancers of any sort, it suggests that there's a genetic predisposition to it. And it's very important that you do your best to avoid the secondhand smoke. At the same time, at the other end of the spectrum, there are several new genetic tests that are out there, which may be able to kind of estimate your predilection for many kinds of cancers. And that is a science that is evolving rapidly. And I'm sure uh, RAK Hospitals also has this methodology in place where you can test the genetic sequences to see what is your risk for various kinds of cancers. So using the modern knowledge of your risk factor very specifically for the kind of mutation, along with avoiding secondhand tobacco smoke will minimize your chance of getting any kinds of cancer. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Sai. Uh, there is one interesting question for Dr. Savita. Ma'am, you were just uh, talking about uh, social uh, smoking. Uh, Mr. Vetri Francis has asked, hookah is a very common thing for socializing. Many, uh, are uh, tobacco less also, but are these a risk factor uh, as a traditional cigarette? Yes, uh, tobacco is tobacco. And like I said, I showed you the journey of smoking. It starts with initiation and then it moves into social and before you know it, it goes into habitual. So hopefully you won't come to a time. I'm, I'm not going to judge you on your casual or on your social smoking. Uh, you are an adult and if you've heard this presentation, you're already aware of the journey. But what I will say is that hopefully there will not come a time when you move from casual uh, socializing and smoking to then not being able to smoke, not smoke if you are socializing. Because then uh, socializing will get associated and conditioned with smoking, whether it is a hookah or whether it is a cigarette. And every time you go out to socialize, you will look for a cigarette 
or uh, a hookah to have. So that is when you will start enter entering the dangerous ground of addiction. And I will say better to disassociate these two rather than to allow this conditioning to become stronger and stronger. Remember, yeah, conditioning but... comes from uh, the very first and old experiment that was conducted by Pavlov, a Russian scientist, where uh, it, it was something that worked with an animal, a dog, definitely human beings being so intelligent, sometimes our mind and our thinking works against us. So if the dog could salivate to the ringing of a bell, not to food, but to the ringing of a bell, because these two were associated and, and conditioned together, then socializing and smoking can get very seriously conditioned together. Very true, ma'am. Very true. Uh, there is one interesting question. Uh, Dr. Sai and Dr. Savita, I would uh, request you to both of you give your aspects. Uh, Mr. Shoheb Hussain has asked, I am 35 years old. I am recently uh, diagnosed as a pre-diabetic. I am strongly dependent on smoking. I smoke e-cigarettes. Is it a safe? He's asking about e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, one of the, uh, just going back to the previous hookah question, there are some you know, good data on this. One hour of hookah use is 100 puffs of a cigarette. So it's a lot. True. It's not very uh, true. minimal at all. It, it, and if you actually look at the packaging of the hookah product, it's got all the warnings of it. Nobody sees it because it's already put in the box uh, right. and it's already you know, combusting. So, so in terms of uh, the question by the uh, gentleman with the uh, Pre-diabetic pre uh, yeah, right, right. and yeah, right, yeah, you may or may not know this, but pre-diabetes has now been redefined into a HP A1C of 5.7 or below. So mm. before it was, you know, much higher. Now it's actually much lower. So many of us might actually be pre-diabetic, and it's important to recognize that it's you can actually prevent diabetes by many factors. Tobacco is a known risk factor for promoting diabetes, so you definitely are at risk for it. Now, e-cigarettes in terms of, there's two aspects to it. One of it is that one, it's not legal in many countries anymore. The second aspect to it is that the nicotine vapor, we still don't know why, but some people end up with a condition which is very much like COVID, that is actually called a uh, ventilator, like rather a vapor associated lung injury, and that has damaged many people's lungs. There's some controversy in using e-cigarettes as a quitting mod modality. The United Kingdom actually says it might be a reasonable way to do it. The US FDA does not think that's a good way to do it. And partly because of what Savita told you earlier, you don't know where you move from a casual use to an addictive use. That kind of marker of when things change is not very clearly defined. So from that standpoint, e-cigarettes are your last choice in terms of using to quit tobacco use. Now, the, the fact that you have recognized that this is a problem is actually the first big step to a solution, like many things in life. And I think the fact that you recognize and are actually brave enough to attend this webinar, actually ask this question of public forum, tells that you're not just the pre-contemplative phase, but you're actually ready to take that journey towards getting rid of tobacco. So I applaud you for actually coming up and doing that. Savita, I'm sure you can add much more light on this. Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, your please. Sai Praveen, I absolutely agree. Uh, the fact that you asked this question indicates that that fear is already in your mind. The thought and, and, and uh, you know, you're already thinking about whether this is good or not. So I encourage you to think some more. I encourage you to read more in this area, to, you know, attend more such sessions, because all of that is going to go towards firming your thinking more and more. You already have a possible health factor coming up, and that is uh, diabetes, possible. If you don't take care of uh, all related lifestyle changes right now, then that is going to become a reality tomorrow. You must understand that uh, smoking and diabetes both are major cardiac risk factors. You don't want to egg yourself into a journey of cardiac situations later on. Uh, you know what they say about treatment. The best treatment is prevention. And you are still at that stage when you can work on prevention rather than on cure. So wouldn't you like to keep the treatment in your own hands rather than surrender to uh, professionals who will definitely be there to help you? But before that, you can help yourself. So I will suggest to you rather than, uh, you know, you go into too, you know, too much of whatever I have to say. In, with a pre-diabetic, one of the best health factors that you can get is exercise. Why don't you try going into a regular round of exercise and you will find that when you become regular with exercise, that in fact 
is a positive trigger that will keep reminding you to move away from the cigarettes. So do this by yourself, you know, beyond all your reading and so on, pick up this health habit of exercising regularly. And you might find that that habit uh, stands you in good stead when it comes to quitting, first of all, cutting down and then quitting. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, it was a very wonderful explanation. Many of the queries which we received so have been addressed uh, in the session, but I will take two more questions. Uh, one, Dr. Sai has already uh, answered. One gentleman has asked uh, how much exercise or how much walking should be done. Dr. Sai has already explained 150 minutes per week in general for a medical after a medical evaluation. Uh, I will just add one uh, small uh, point in it uh, because now you are having a habit of smoking. You are already taking a lot of uh, carbon dioxide and monoxide with the smoke. Your oxygen level is uh, dropping. Instead of uh, going 150 uh, minutes per week, many people do uh, we weekend exercise. So two days or uh, one day at the end of the week, uh, they are doing lot of exercise instead of that you should split into daily 15 to 30 minutes of walking jogging brisk walk whatever the way of cardio exercise you should do and uh, do some breathing exercise also this will be very helpful i will take last question uh, ma'am already you have answered this about a nicotine replacement is it safe you have already answered, but I will uh, just request you to uh, answer it again. Is nicotine replacement therapy safe? Remember what I said right in the beginning? Uh, yeah. NRT is much safer than tobacco consumption. So True. let that stop you from having that fear. Because if you have started your journey or are even thinking of starting your journey of cutting down and quitting, and if you believe that you will not be able to do this by yourself, and that is a very realistic thought that you have, then first of all, I will urge you to take professional help. And in professional help, if there is a group setting, then that is going to benefit you much more because a group is known well to work together. Every one quitter motivates the other and so on. But at the least, there could be a buddy system where two of you work along with a professional in quitting. And if you still feel that with all of this, your journey is not moving forward as you would like it to. Please take the help of NRT so that you are able to quit, be it with the help of external support. Some people tell themselves that I'm going to do this on my own. Don't make this an, uh, a matter of ego and quitting. Take all the support that you need, but move on the journey of quitting and cutting down. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Sai, uh, one gentleman has asked, this is a very good question. Uh, what is the best uh, breathing exercise to be done uh, to get rid of uh, the bad effects of the smoking? So if you really look at the way we all breathe, we are using yeah. a tiny, tiny portion of our lung capacity. So that's the fact that we can actually increase our deep breathing, sit up straight, etc. Those are just some things which will compensate for any lung capacity that has decreased because of tobacco use. That's one part of it. The other side of it is, of course, avoiding dust, avoiding pollution, and doing deep breathing exercises so that you become used to using your entire lungs and also using your diaphragm to breathe, especially if you already have some lung issues related to tobacco. The other aspect to really explore is whether you would be a candidate for something like if you have a medical condition where you require inhalers or you require medicines to relax your air tubes, that people who smoke end up with a squishing in the air tubes because of the allergic reaction or the bronchospasm. So you may need inhalers or specific therapy. And people with COPD, for example, need these kinds of therapies. So it would be important to kind of figure out if you already are exposed to tobacco, what do you do? And if you have some lung damage, how do you measure that lung damage? And what are the specific simple exercises you can do starting with taking deep breath? And of course, if you're overweight or obese, coming back to an ideal body weight would also help you with the breathing process. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sai. Uh, Professor, uh, I have covered all the questions and if there is any uh, left out question, we will definitely reply in the mail. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Wilku. Thank you ever so much. And ladies and gentlemen, I would be remiss if I did not inform you that Dr. Wilku 
is the working bee in our webinars. He is the one who sources our faculty. He is the one who puts the program together and I'm thankful to him. But I, uh, I, I um, am reluctant to let our speakers go. Uh, and I apologize for uh, being as possessed. May I request uh, Dr. Sayer Savita, uh, 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 may I request you to kindly give us a closing thought. If you could encapsulate all the knowledge that you have presented and give us one uh, closing thought, uh, what would that be? Uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Sai Praveen, from your side, sir, first. Sure, thank you, Dr. Kennedy. I think I've kind of reinforced and reiterated throughout my talk that your take home message today is identify a smoker in your environment and have a chat with him on what you can do to impact that. Because a lot of time, tobacco is not just a habit, there's a story behind it. Try to find that story and see if you can impact it. And now to you, Dr. Savita, as always, the last word. <laughs> Dr. Savita, if you could give us a take, a takeaway or a take home message, uh, what would that be? The problem with amassing a lot of knowledge, and I speak for all of us, uh, is that after amassing a lot of knowledge, you love to speak about all the knowledge you have amassed. So I'll be happy to give you, a, you know, remind, uh, you know, a few more words that I've already spoken. Friends, I would like to leave you with just two thoughts. Remember that smokers are in the most productive age group. Roughly speaking, just broadly speaking, you can say between 16, 17, 18, on the one hand to about 59, on the other hand, this is the most productive age group for a family, for a country, uh, for, the, for the world as a globe. So uh, you are causing damage to yourself when you should be the most productive. That is something for you to remember. And the second thing I will say in your journey of cutting down and quitting, and why am I talking about your journey? Every person who smokes contemplates quitting. 70% of you decide to try, 30 to 40% of you actually try, about 3% of you succeed. So every smoker contemplates quitting. And in your journey of quitting, I will just remind you of one thing. Move away from the thought of self-mastery. You are not the master of nicotine. Nicotine is your master. You are not the master. I just like that you remember this. You are not in control. Nicotine is in control. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savita. Uh, 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 I'm presenting my vote of thanks in a manner of speaking, and I cannot thank uh, faculty enough. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Sai. I know how busy you are. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Savita. I certainly know how busy you are, and I'm grateful that you were able to overcome that little problem with your computer. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank my audience who faithfully, time after time, this is our 13th webinar, but time after time, we get an audience from, and we are amazed uh, from several countries, as a matter of fact, uh, we are required to account for this from time to time. And I believe that we have more than 17 countries that sit in and listen to our, to our webinars. I, I believe that we had a large gathering today also, and I thank our audience for this. Now, uh, I, I, I would like to thank my support team, and that support team comes from the Iraq Hospital, it is the marketing division, it is the IT division, it is the medical division, uh, it is my very own wellness division. Without the, uh, without the superb integration between these units, we would never have uh, a webinar that moves out as smoothly as it does and as often as it does. And I would like very much to thank the members of the UNDRR Arise Board. This is the UN and uh, the Arise Group of the UAE 
who manage the larger aspects of disaster. I want to thank them very much for supporting us. And I am deeply grateful that you uh, gave us a little time by listening in on this webinar. Uh, uh, last but not least, I have to tell you that our next topic is an equally interesting one. And you'll be surprised to know that our next topic is the experiences of COVID survivors. The experiences of COVID survivors. This is on the 25th of September, a Saturday, and we look forward to having you with us. Thank you once more, ladies, gentlemen, my faculty, my support staff, and everyone. Thank you for being available for us today. Thank you and good day. Thank you, sir.